Paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. Tambu Mackenzie was a young model and beauty queen. Tambu started uh, doing modeling when we were still in primary school. She would walk in heels when she was going to town. In 2010, she was enjoying a charmed life as wife and mother. So when I saw her, I was like, wow. The way she was dancing and all, I was like, she has to be mine, this one. But now an aggressive tumor is devouring her whole face. I strive because I know I'm not, I don't want my daughter growing up without her man. Tambu's traveled thousands of miles from her home in South Africa to meet one of the world's leading facial surgeons. Hello, Dan. Hello. Lovely to see you. He's her last hope to get rid of this disease. She's carrying around two kilograms of tumor in her head. It's a parasite eating all the body's energy without treatment. She'll be dead within three months. It's a groundbreaking operation. Can I have uh, a saw, please? Involving six surgeons. Noradrenaline, GTN, dobutamine, just everything. This is not a normal situation. I don't want to be left alone with my little angel. I mean, as a father, you need a mother figure there always. Can the hand-picked team save Tambu's face? After four years of unsuccessful treatment for cancerous tumors in Africa, Tambu has flown 6,000 miles to the UK with her younger sister, Edzai, to meet an extraordinary surgeon who believes he can save her life. This operation is something that I've been waiting for for years now since this started. I've always wanted an operation that's, that's able to at least take all of it out. I receive patients from all over the world who, like Tambo, who, who are problem cases. But I've challenged myself throughout my career doing operations that I've never seen done before. Tambu is from a family of six siblings who all grew up together in Zimbabwe. Half are now living in the UK. Tambu started uh, doing modeling when we were still in primary school. And Tambu, we used to joke about it because, like, she would walk in heels when she's going to town. She wouldn't get tired. So we just knew that she was a fashion diva. <laughs> in 2007, at 19, Tambu met the man who was to become the love of her life. And the first time I met her, it was at a friend's wedding. So when I saw her, I was like, wow. The way she was dancing and all, I was like, she has to be mine, this one. Married a year later, they moved from Zimbabwe to South Africa. We had dreams because she wanted to do civil engineering and I wanted to do computer science. And that's how we were planned. There was no hint of Tambu's illness when daughter Pearl was born in 2010. I was delivered, I think, around 5 in the morning. And she had a big nose like mine. <laughs> so then, then the nurses were like, yo, what did you do to this baby and all that? I, I was so happy, man. Up to now, she's a blessing to us. She has kept it so close, so, like, so close together. But less than a year later, Tambu started getting severe headaches. I bought her some anodine from the pharmacy. When she took those, the headaches and all that stuff went away, but it was just for a few hours. So when it went away that time, I was like, ah, oh, thank God, I think she's okay now. But that was just the beginning. The forehead started swelling up. And then I was like, oh my goodness. When the cancer arrived, it really changed everything in our lives. 
Because when you hear about cancer, the first thing you think, you just th think about is death. Tambu had multiple operations in South Africa. But despite chemotherapy and radiotherapy, her tumor is back, more aggressive than ever. It's called chondrosarcoma. This is a normal, healthy skull. And this is Tambu's. Bone and tissue ravaged by two cancer tumors growing in her skull. The large tumor has destroyed most of the central bones in her face. It's also displaced her left eye and robbed her of her sense of smell. And its closeness to her brain makes further operations extremely difficult. But without surgery, she will die within months. Professor Ian Hutchison has a world-class reputation for tackling cases nobody else wants. And he's Tambu's last hope. Chondrosarcoma is one of the rarest of cancers. I've treated, I think, three patients in the whole of my career. It's difficult for me to say how aggressive it is. Um, all that I can say is that it certainly doesn't respond to chemotherapy or radiotherapy. We've got no nasal bone. There's no bone here. She does have a nose, but it's being supported by tumor now. The tumor's eaten away that completely. It's eaten away the upper jaw. It's made a great big hole in her palate. There's no hope for any sense of smell at all. There's no, no way that any nerves could survive the assault by this tumor. She's spending most of her day sleeping in bed because she's carrying around two kilograms of tumor in her head. And I think that she'll be dead in, within three months without treatment. It's consultation day. Peddy and Pearl are still in South Africa with visa problems. So Tambu's brought her extended family, who live in the UK, to her first hospital visit with the professor. Hello there, Tambu. Hello. Lovely to see you. The tumor goes right over here. It may well be that your nose, the bone inside, will have to go. Obviously, it's going to be technically very difficult to take out all the tumor. It's pressing against the brain, but it's not invading the brain. Once the tumor is removed, Tambu's new face will be reconstructed from rib and tissue taken from her back. The big problem with it is that there's a three to five percent chance that it fails. If it fails, it fails a hundred percent. And what that means is that you will probably die. So if it does fail, it's catastrophic. Six thousand miles away in Cape Town, what's at stake seems even more magnified. But Tambu is determined to fight on. I'm still young. I'm not going to leave a daughter. I'm not going to die because I have a daughter that needs a mum. I don't want to be left alone with my little angel. I mean, as a father, you need a mother figure there always. Tambu McKenzie is a 27-year-old mum who has traveled 6,000 miles to the UK for a life-saving operation. Yeah. Ready, friend? Okay. Uh, yeah. She's got two kilograms of cancerous tumors that are ripping apart her face. And with weeks to live, this surgery is her last chance. I'm a determined person. I'm fighting this through. I know this is just the beginning, so um, I have to be strong. Professor Hutchinson is my last hope. The surgical team is led by Professor Ian Hutchison, who runs the research charity Saving Faces, which is devoted to the prevention and treatment of facial diseases. Hello. Today, he's taking on one of the most challenging operations of his career. We'll call it one operation, but 
Actually, it's a, it's a medley of operations. It's an assembly of operations. What's going to happen is that the neurosurgeon will operate first. He'll take out that lump here. He'll open up the old scar. He'll go inside the head, and he will lift the brain away from the tumor. It's 10.30 in the morning, and neurosurgeon Ian Sabin makes the first cut to begin to remove the smallest of the two tumors. What I'm trying to do is separate the scalp from it without making a hole in the tumor. It's the skull's actually destroyed partly by it, so I'm going to have to take it out with the bone. Years of woodwork. Let's just stop that bleeding. Okay, wet swab, thanks. Good. Specimen one, temporal tumor. After one hour in theater, the first tumor is removed. Now the very difficult and technical job of removing the larger mass through the face. The aim is ideally to take the tumor out all in one piece. However, it's possible that we'll have difficulty getting the tumor out in one piece because we're going to be taking it out from the brain out through the face. It's a two-handed job to delicately peel back Tambu's face. But this tumor is obviously a very aggressive one. The frontal lobes are the seat of emotion. And so if the frontal lobes are damaged, and they can be damaged just by pressing on them, then that can change personality dramatically. If we did damage the main arteries supplying the brain, that can cause the whole half of the brain to die and swell and can cause death. So it's not, not true. Can I have the knife, please? 15 blade. 15 blade, thank you. What I've done now is I've peeled the nose back. I'm going to make a cut up there with some scissors. The professor is cutting out the tumor very close to Tambu's eye. He's about to find out if it's attacked her optic nerve. She can't see out of her right eye. The only sense I can save is the vision in the left eye. Tambu's been in theater for over seven hours, and to help the professor at this critical stage is leading eye surgeon, David Verity. If the optic nerve is in here, it's gone. Yes, but I don't think it's... No, it, no, it doesn't. No, 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 exactly no. right. We've got the optic oh. nerve now quite nicely. Optic nerve is there. But at the moment, it looks like she's liable to keep both of the both of the globes, and she may still see with the left eye. So, you know, so far, we're about as optimistic as we could be, I would have thought. It's not just the eye I want to preserve. It's all the muscles and the blood vessels around it. With the optic nerve intact, it's time to move on to stage three of the operation, cutting free the large tumor that's pressing on her brain. It's exhausting carrying around this excess weight in her face. You're looking at the premolar teeth and the molar teeth. I'm obviously going to try and preserve some of the upper jaw so that she can eat and chew. After nine hours of surgery, the professor is on the verge of removing the tumor. Can I have the scissors, please? There we are. It just came away in my hand. So why don't we put this down somewhere? Two kilograms of dead weight has been successfully removed from Tambu's head. The tumors might have gone. Tambu now has no face. Her brain is lethally exposed, and without an elaborate reconstruction, she'll die. 
all the family can do is wait. When we found out it was cancer, to me, I just saw, I just felt like I was losing her. I didn't know, I was just helpless. Edzai and Tambu were born just a year apart. In 2003, their father died after a road traffic accident. And two years later, their mother passed away suddenly after a short illness. Tambu immediately took that, um, that responsibility and she took the role as the eldest sister. I could say she took the role as the mother. I think she's come this far because of the strength that she has. I always ask myself, had it been me, maybe I would have already given up, but she keeps just pushing, and she keeps pushing even me. She tells me, don't be scared. Don't be scared, because everything is all right. Edzai is in constant touch with Paddy back in South Africa. To me, I still see the beauty in her. When I used to work with her, when she was modeling, Everyone was looking at me like, wow, this guy is, must be happy because she's so pretty, beautiful and everything. And when she started getting sick and all that stuff, people still look at me. And some people, they gave me an eye like, what are you doing with her? Like, you know, that kind of eye. She's still the tambu that I met the first day I met her. I'm the one who's the lucky guy to be in her life because she's a beautiful person, inside and out. Professor and his team are now about to start the major reconstruction of Tambu's face. To rebuild Tambu's missing nose and part of the upper jaw, the professor will first cut out two of her ribs and then fix these to her cheekbones and upper jaw. A piece of skin and muscle tissue from her back will seal the hole in her face. The sucker on maximum. The professor and his team have now been working on Tambu for nearly 10 hours. Can I have uh, a saw, please? Have you got the plates and screws ready? What we're doing now is we're trying to fit the rib to reconstruct her face. We're fracturing it in the middle so that it gives better projection to the face. Rib is ideal because it doesn't have to be a weight-bearing bone, and so that will bend and fit into that place. With the rib bones in place, the professor turns his attention to the muscle and skin from Tambu's back which will form her new face. We call them flaps, which is basically a bulk of tissue you, which you can hold in your, your two hands, which we can take away without causing undue harm at that site in the body. And they have one artery pumping blood into them and one vein taking blood out of them. Crucially, the new skin flap needs feeding from a blood supply in Tambu's neck. She's gonna have a very, very full face afterwards until the muscle shrinks away. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. The team's been nearly 15 hours in surgery. Whoops! What's happening? We can turn the microscope off and turn the lights on. Turn the lights on. Lights on. There's a problem with the blood supply to the new skin. It's struggling to get through. Now, the flap's awfully cold. Yeah, but can I just, yeah, can I just deal with this crisis, please? The flap has no blood going through it. I don't see any sign of any blood. If the team can't get a blood supply to the new tissue, then the reconstruction will fail. Is that artery still pulsating? Yeah, it is. Yeah. 
she could die of the complications of a long operation like deep vein thrombosis, blockage of her airway, damage to the inside the head, the brain. These are all risks. 25 hours in surgery. Oh, look! The vein is filling. So, <laughs> success. <coughs> it may not seem a lot, <coughs> but we've got blood coming out of the flap now. After two attempts, the team have managed to get the blood pumping through the artery into the new flap. There is a distinct risk of her dying if the flap fails. So, you know, and she was warned about that. But, I mean, nonetheless, I don't... Uh, the last time I had a patient die as a consequence of surgery was with a neurosurgeon as well, and that was in 1990. So, you know, I haven't, I haven't had one of these, you know, for 20, 25 years. So it's... It's pretty disastrous. After her groundbreaking surgery, Tambu has been recovering in intensive care. But six days on, the reconstruction has failed. The new skin has died. It's rotting on Tambu's face. The whole of this flap is surviving on one artery pumping blood in and one vein draining blood out, unless that join works, then the flap will die. Tambu's older brother, Milton, who lives with his family in Essex, is heading to the hospital. She said it to me many times. She said, you know, I know this is a difficult time in my life, but I don't think, I'm not, I'm not going to allow this to kill me. <laughs> She's always been the strong one. She's got a lot of people to fight for now. She's got her own family as well to think about. The professor must break the news to her family that Tambu's life is still hanging by a thread. For me, it's been a personal disaster. I've, uh, you know, failure doesn't happen often, but when failure happens, you, you have to confront it, um, and you have to try and work out, particularly when you've got to save somebody's life, you've got to try and find ways around the problem if we don't achieve a seal between the brain and the face and the mouth, because there's a hole through to the mouth, um, then all the bacteria that are there will get into the brain and cause encephalitis and meningitis and death. Tambu now has no face. All her family can do is hope. Flap let her down. I couldn't eat. I was numb. I was so afraid. Seeing that person, that strong person lying in bed all the time, it was, it was not good at all. It's a week since Tambu Mackenzie underwent a 26-hour life-saving operation to remove cancerous tumors from her face. For Professor Ian Hutchison, the operation has been one of the most difficult he's tackled in over 30 years. Although he successfully saved her sight and removed the tumors, the skin flap reconstruction has failed. I'm very unhappy about it. I've been anxious about it since the operation. And, uh, and it hasn't gone, the reconstructive side hasn't gone smoothly at all. And it's very important the reconstructive side goes smoothly for the survival of Tambo. It means the professor has no choice but to put Tambu back on the operating table. If you have failure, you have to question why, why it's failed. Is it my personal ability? Uh, you know, have I done something catastrophically wrong here to cause failure? Should I be giving up surgery completely? You feel sick as a dog, and you can't countenance failure, although in your head you think, is it going to fail again? Is it going to fail again? So you, it's, it's horrific. For Tambu's husband, Peddy, 
stuck thousands of miles away in Cape Town. It's heartbreaking news. Everything stopped. I couldn't even work properly. I took some days off at work so that I could just be home and pray. I mean, the most hurting thing is he's so far away from us and me not being there as well. You know how it is to hear some information about your wife that you know so you can't see what's going on and all that stuff. It's very hard for me. It's been four weeks since his wife left for the operation. Peddy relies heavily on updates from Tambu's older brother, Milton. I speak to Peddy all the time. I can't even start to imagine how he feels. But he's got his, like what he was saying to me, he said he's got his little girl with him. She helps him go through the days as well. With the family waiting for news, the professor is trying to understand why, with a 95% success rate, Tambu's reconstruction has failed. A 27-year-old should not be in that group. We've got to determine why it failed this time so that it doesn't fail next time. A lot of surgeons find it difficult to see their patients when they're having complications, but it is the very moment when you have to be there for the patient. Whilst the professor plans the next operation to save Tambu's life, the family are all pulling together. Another major operation means more expense. We're all just focused on this one operation that she was gonna have to remove the tumor. We didn't anticipate on any complications or any other treatments that she might need. They've already raised over 30,000 pounds. The surgical team have given their time for free, but all other costs have to be met through fundraising. Now, because she's had the first operation, the flap failed, and we're looking at almost another 30,000, which, which we don't have, and we have to start doing the fundraising again. Whilst waiting for news about Tambu, the family have decided to run a half marathon and raise some funds. Tambu knows that we are running today and she'll be the one giving us a massage after because we would definitely need one. Yorkie and cousin Susan have never run a half marathon before. Okay, here we come. Oh, yeah. Ready? Gotta win this, gotta be at the front. <laughs> <laughs> At nine miles, I wanted to give up. But then I just thought I would have to go in first and tell her that I, I, I couldn't do it. So that, that's what kept me going. Because we kept pushing each other. We didn't think we'd get here, did we? No. <laughs> wow, Even Tambu's nieces and nephews are getting in on the act. You know we are making cakes for Auntie Tambu? Yeah. They're doing their own bake-off. It smells so nice. <laughs> <laughs> to sell down at the local footy club. Thank you very much. What, how much are they? Pound. One pound, and who made these? Who made, who made them? Oh, brilliant. Right, there you go, then. <laughs> the fundraising distracts as they wait for news about Tambu. The professor has been running a series of tests to try and find out why the new tissue on Tambu's face has failed. I've had to call in blood doctors to look at whether she clots 
unusually in her bloodstream. I've had to call in doctors who put dye into the arteries to see the pattern of blood flow through the arteries in the head and neck and face. But there's some very, very unusual things that happened. So Tambu, this is the anesthetic room. And this is where we'll be sending you off to sleep, making sure you're comfortable. Her arteries were much, much narrower than normal. Highly unusual. She'd had chemotherapy. Is that what caused the changes in the, in the blood vessels? But what was most bizarre, and I've never, ever seen it before, oh. was that the external carotid artery blocked at its exit. So we couldn't use the left-hand side again at all because there was no artery there, no external carotid artery. It's just over a week now since Tambu's first operation. Her face is rotting, and she's in a critical condition. To rebuild Tambu's face, the professor is going to use tissue from her leg. Probably the most important thing we have to do so that she survives and doesn't die as a result of the operation is to seal that great big hole between the brain and the face. But to do this, the professor has to connect the tissue to an artery deep inside her head. I've only taken that occipital artery to reconstruct a facial problem once before. And that artery is the professor's only chance of getting a strong blood supply to feed Tambu's new flap. But will he be able to find it? The first thing I'm going to do is to remove the flap. We can see some of the dead flap already coming out of her mouth. Professor Hutchison is starting a 14-hour operation to save Tambu. The necrotizing skin has been removed. You, you can see in here that this is all the dead muscle, bone and skin that we took from the back last time. Um, and it's, it, you can smell it, it's very odorous, it's not, it's not survived. And we, we've taken it all out and it's all gone. And we've got to make sure that we've got a clean base now. The blood vessel doctor said, give her heparin at high dose to thin her blood. And of course that makes a risk of bleeding, which is a problem. Now, the professor moves on to the most difficult part of the operation, finding a suitable artery to feed the new flap. Can I have uh, scissors, please? OK, the HP's just sort of drifted down to um, 8.2. Yeah. So we'll just give her a unit. Terrific. See there's a nice big facial artery there. It's a little bit tense because we still quite haven't got the vessels at the head, head end that we are happy with. And, uh, and because of all the other treatment she's had, it's quite a difficult dissection. I've got a vein and a, an artery. <coughs> OK, I've cut it now, for good or ill. So it reaches up to there. We don't know yet whether this is going to be long enough. We don't know whether this flow is going to be adequate enough. After seven intensive hours in surgery, it's time for a break. I try not to break for too long, because then the adrenaline stops. Because what's keeping me going, I think, is just my adrenaline. I always feel anxious, because although I know what I'm going to do, I know that it's going to be challenging. It's time to take the tissue from Tambu's leg to attempt to rebuild her face for the second time. Uh, let's get the flap. The flap's here. OK. Why can't I get a head over anymore? It is rather big, isn't it? It is rather big, yes. <laughs> a week ago, the blood failed to connect. If it doesn't work this time, Tambu will die. No adrenaline, GTN, dobutamine, just everything. We want, to, we want to see blood flowing back down the vein. Yeah. 
we've just taken the clamps off and uh, it's not it's not going through normally what happens is the blood gushes through and you get little leaks and things and we haven't had that the pressure going through is not as good as it should be last time the flap failed in the days after the operation so even with the new flap sewn in, the professor can't relax. This is not a normal situation. We don't have an artery which is going <laughs> and exploding up. So am I going to sleep well tonight? No. Am I going to sleep well tomorrow night? No. Am I going to sleep well the night afterwards? No. I'm, I'm not going to sleep well until this has been working for seven days. When Tambo was getting the biggest operation in England, it was so hard for me in a way that I'm used to always being there when something's happening. And I was like, my goodness, God just be with her. And I was more worried about my little angel because Pearl is always asking about the mom. So it was just something very hard for us. It's just over three weeks since Tambu McKenzie has been on an operating table for a total of 39 hours to give her the chance of a future with her daughter and husband, Peddy. I was very worried that something might just happen when I'm not there. I didn't have, like, you know, full force when, when I was at work. It was very hard for me. I just had to man up and do it. As a husband, I mean, I had to do that, even though it's not easy. I can't really tell you how I feel because I cannot, I cannot put that into words. She's always been a strong kind of person, yeah. The day will come when we just walk out. I think, yeah, I think that day will come. Now, five days later, at last there's good news. The skin flap has taken and the blood is successfully keeping it alive. Hello! But it's still too big for Tambu to open her eye and mouth. Leaking. There's one more operation I need to do to you, which is a small one by, by these standards. It's, a, it's to trim the scraping bulk, to move your eye, left eye into a better position, to get your eyelids to open. Just have a look at that. Squeeze them tight, relax. I think because it's interfering with your vision out of your left eye, uh, we should try and get it done fairly soon. The face is the most vital part of the body. We take food through here. We breathe through here. Now, her nose is completely blocked by the flap, so she can't breathe through her nose. So she's got a tracheostomy in at the moment. I want her returning to normality as quickly as possible. What's your favorite food? Well, I'll get you to write it down, because you can't talk at the moment, OK? Macaroni cheese. OK, all right, well, we'll get you some macaroni cheese first thing, all right? OK, open for me. Tambu's jaw is wedged shut. It needs constant painful manipulation with spatulas to prise it open. So now, watch this. This will be more uncomfortable, Tambu, OK? So you slide it in, and it's like a wedge. It forces it open. Ooh, okay. OK, don't worry, don't worry, that's good. OK, that's good, OK? Fine. All right, I'm not going to put in any more, not for the moment, all right? Is that hurting you a bit there? That's what we want. I, but we'll count five minutes now. For Tambu, her family's support will be crucial to her recovery. I do know that she needs another reconstructive um, surgery. So, as of now, the only thing that I picture is more of these hospital visits. And obviously, she would have done the same for me. I'd like to just come and spend time with her, even if it's just for, for a short time, but just to see her. 
she's my baby sister, so I always worry. But I, I feel, at the moment, I feel like she's out of danger. A few days later, and she's back in theater. This time, it's about reducing the size of the skin flap so she can see. We've now got the globe, I think, far enough forward. You can see it's much further. Look now. It's much further forward. No, no. There's the eye now. The eye's in a good position now. We've adjusted the lids so there are, uh, there's less what we call hooding, so they're covering the eye less. Very happy that we are now in a state where she can probably eat by mouth, breathe by mouth, and see. Almost three weeks later, Tambu is about to be discharged. Her eye and mouth are recovering well. So sore, but getting better. At least I can, I can swallow, I can eat soft foods, but it's still a bit sore, so I can't take, like, hard, hard stuff. I have to take soft foods. Now she can talk, she can speak to her husband and daughter for the first time in months. I miss them a lot. <laughs> I miss them a lot. I don't even know what to say. It's just, it's just crazy. Mommy! 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 Hey, how are you? I you cry? Yes! I'm going to cry when I see you. What about you? Are you going to cry? Yeah. I love you so much, my darling. I love you, mommy. Okay. I'm going to give you a hug, okay? I Bye love you. Mommy. Okay. Bye. After nine weeks in hospital, Tambu is finally discharged. I think we are almost at the end. Of course, there's still other procedures to be done, but I'm happy so far. Tambu is a very passionate person, a very loving person, and a very strong person. What the prof has done is really amazing. I mean, when he was saying it and he was talking of draining veins and arteries and all sorts, you're just thinking, What's, what the hell is he talking about? But I mean, we all can see is cut her open, taken the tumor out, drained all those little veins and arteries, and it's great work, great stuff. I'm very pleased with Tambo's progress. There's really only one thing that has to be corrected, and that is, although she can see out of her left eye, she can't open her eyelids, so she needs some, a small operation on her eyelids to move them up so that she'll be able to see much better. The second thing is, we might do some more operations to reduce the bulk of the flap on her face so that it looks more normal in contour. Then she'll be ready to go back to South Africa to Pearl, her daughter, and to her husband. Three months ago, Tambu's two kilogram tumor meant all she could do was sleep. She won't be reunited with Peddy and Pearl for at least another six months, but at least she has her siblings to support her. Thank you. <laughs> it's a long process. I'm not 100%, but I'm getting there. My vision is fine. With my mouth, I, could, I couldn't eat for two months. So starting to eat, it's like teaching a, a, a newborn baby to eat. Nothing has changed. I'm still the same old me. If it wasn't for Pearl, I, I don't think I would have fought it even harder. Because I just used to tell myself, I have to do this for my daughter. Paddy has been there for me when this started, and he's never left my side. Tambo's family, they are the strongest people that I've ever met in my life. <laughs> and they've been there for both of us, 110%. If they were there, always. And they're always there, and I know they promise to be there always. So I love those guys. Mm -hmm. 